about the the weather. So just saying hi so that everyone gets to see who is, who I am. I'll continue just in, in the darkness. Yeah, so my name is Brian Amani. I'm the employer brand executive at Unilever Kenya. And uh, that uh, in the simplest form means that I manage how we just communicate with the universities and with young people and to just make sure that we are educating or rather just telling people about how our ways of working uh, at, at, at different companies is and especially with this topic now, topic of the day, preparing for employment in today's, today's digital world, just looking at all the recent adv advancements in technology and the fact that even now people are working from home, how we're able to cope with things such as those and just to navigate new ways of working. With me here is uh, Michael Gadu. Uh, Michael is, will be taking us through the topic of the day. And um, yeah, he's uh, cool people. So Michael, over to you. Thanks so much for the intro, Brian. I'm hoping you can hear me loud and clear. You can see my video as well. Yeah, just to interrupt your mic just a bit. Uh, guys, yep. feel free to type your, your, your name and campus or whatever you're doing with life right now in the chat space so that you're just able to see who you're interacting with and we can create a conversation from there. Cool, cool. Okay, Mike. Okay, perfect. So I think um, I'm just thinking about today's session as you, more your session than than uh, a session that I'm putting together for you. So even as Brian mentioned, feel free to type your questions, feel free to let's make it more of a conversation and less of an actual, you know, presentation from me to you, because at the end of the day, this has more value to you, to you in as much as it also adds value to me as well. So for today's session, um, I think one of the things that I just wanted to mention is there's this concept that we speak about a lot um, about the world being VUCA. And it's just about thinking about how it's very volatile. There's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of complexity and ambiguity. We just don't know what, what is happening in this world. And when we think about at the beginning of this year, who knew that you know an invisible enemy would come and would literally almost stop the world. So if you think about it, uh, toilet paper companies became rich, uh, airlines became, you know, the poor companies. Students, you know, the school shut down and they ended up having a lot of fun. Um, but at the same time, that means we have an issue with, with um, the education system and, and uh, some pauses in people's lives. The stock market crashed. And at the same time, sports funds became, became loners at home in as much as you know the premier league has come back just recently and i just wanted to start off with a quick joke um you know just think about yourself if you are an arsenal fan you know um so liverpool was on route to win the their first premier league title and then coronavirus basically just came and smashed uh, right into their head and then for about three months you know nothing happened in terms of um the premier league and then Arsenal got the chance to to have their first game, you know, post coronavirus. It was kind of like a reset for everyone. And the first game that they have, they get beaten three 0 So you know, it's very smashing in terms of what happens. And that's, I think, this is what I want to talk about when I think about a uh, Fuka world. So let's start off with some house rules. So as I mentioned, this session is for you. So feel free to post questions, um, feel free to make it a conversation and feel free for us to get as much as possible out of this session. So in this world, um, you know, every, all the work that's done in the world can be divided into one of these four different buckets. So we can either say that, you know, work is creative. You can say that it is skilled, which, you know, if it's very professional and directed in a particular way, you can say it's very rote if it's interchangeable, routinized, um, you know, it can be outsourced or managed in a different way. And it can be very robotic, you know, if it, there's a chance for it to be computerized, to be made efficient or to be purchased. So if you think about these four types of work, where do you see yourself fitting in? I'd really love to see, you know, if people can type their questions and at least um, you know i can see some of the answers so where do you think you fit in just put in one two three four 
just for us to know, you know, if you think yourself as a creative person, as you know, a person who would do some skilled work, a person who would be in the road kind of space or robotic. So just waiting for a few answers. So I see Grace has written uh, two skilled. Okay, waiting for a few more responses before we go on. So seeing another person has written two as well, skilled, you want to be a skilled worker. Brian Amani has written one, creative. Kelly G, two. Um, again, another person who's written skilled. Let's keep a few more uh, responses coming before we get on to the next um, point that I want to make. So two as well, um, skilled, um, number one uh, with another vote, creative. Okay, so I think, yes, I'm seeing a couple of more answers coming in, uh, creative and skilled being the most popular options. But to be honest, you want to be more to be creative. And I'll tell you why in this session, why creativity is the most important skill for you to be able to, to survive in this digital aspect. Because if you think about it, unemployment and underemployment are very high in the current world that we live in. And robots are coming in and they're killing jobs. But at the same time, for every job that a, create, a robot is killing, they create another job as well, because the robot needs to be programmed by somebody. The robot cannot do all the jobs. The robot can do the very um, the job that is very repetitive, but at the same time, it cannot do the thinking. And that's where being creative is the most important skill. And I'll show you why it's important for us to think of ourselves as creatives. So just as a summary, the purpose of today's session is not just to empower you for employment, it's to empower you for the future. So think about this as beneficial for you both in your employment, if that's what you want to do. If you want to get into your own kind of space and start your own company, do your own um, work outside of the formal employment way, then at the same time, this session will still enable you a lot to be able to achieve that. So. I would like to introduce a very simple concept, which I think I, I try to adopt a lot, of course, um, and I'll take you through why I think this is the important way for you to be ready for, for the future. So first thing is the concept of active learning, which will go in a bit more detail together. The second one is active experimenting, and we'll talk about that as well. And the last one is active branding, and we'll also talk about those three. So to start off about active learning, so I like kicking off everything with, with a quote. So there's a talk that was done in Toronto that I watch um, on YouTube recently. And um, the presenter was basically saying, it is important to keep learning. Others cannot duplicate work or reproduce your original work. If you want to be original, you have to become an inventor and you have to build the foundation to the structure of your invention from scratch. So what this is basically just telling us is that you know, the most important aspect is keeping learning. The moment you stop learning, then you become old and you become forgotten. So learning is a very important concept. And in this world, it's one of the biggest skills that will enable you to be ready for the future. And it's not just about learning how to learn because at the end of the day, it's very important to learn how to learn. And in fact, there's a book that has been written about learning how to learn. And at the same time, Coursera also offers as a course, a full course on learning how to learn because learning is an important aspect. And importantly, the message I wanted to learn is about knowing yourself. It's about knowing what type of a learner you are because there's very many different types of learners. Think of yourself as you could be a visual learner. You learn from what you see. You could be a learner who learns by doing things. You could be a learner who learns through audiobooks, you know, uh, or even talks that you hear, then that's when you learn. You could be a stress learner, you know, when you know tomorrow is the deadline to the, I mean, the exam is tomorrow, that's, and you basically start uh, studying today, then that's when you get most of the information inside you. You could be an easy learner, you could be the kind of person who during your free time, you like to take out a book, you like to watch um, videos and learn more about yourself, or you could be a scribble learner, you know, the kind of learner who learns when you write out things. Alternatively, you could also be a teacher. You could be, you know, as you're teaching people, then you're also learning. And lastly, you could be a learner who learns um, from copying. And knowing yourself is very important. I can tell you for free, 
that for me, one of the things that I really learned quite early is that I wasn't the kind of learner who learned from books. So I can quickly get, um, you know, to the space where I told myself, you know, if, if based on everything that people say, it's important for you to read a book a day, a book a week, whatever kind of messaging you can hear from different people. For me, I told myself, I'm not going to try and follow what people are saying. I will make it for myself based on the type of learner that I am. So I quickly discovered that I'm a visual learner and I'm an audio learner. So what I did is I do a lot of videos and every day I do about 30 minutes to an hour of learning videos, whether it's YouTube, whether it's TED Talks, whether it's, uh, you know, online courses on things like degree, um, LinkedIn Learning or uh, other places like Coursera. I just basically make sure that because I understand myself, I can be able to, to make myself, make the best for myself by making sure that the learning opportunities that I'm making for myself are based on how I learn. So quickly just, you know, in the next minute or so, if we can just have different people type out what you, what type of a learner you think you are. So I've seen the first person type that they're a visual and kind, kinesthetic learner. Somebody else has written they're a visual and scribble learner. So keep them coming. So we can just see the different types of learners and whether we all know what type of learner we are. Oh, sorry. So there's a visual and stress learner as well, as well in the team. Okay, we're also seeing another scribble learner, somebody who learns when they write out things. Somebody else is a visual and scribble learner. So we can already see that there's very many different types of learners and I'm happy that you've already identified what type of a learner you are and you're taking that to your advantage to basically achieve your learning goals for the for the for your for your own self. And a good question you could ask yourself is why are we talking about learning? You know, you could say I'm not convinced about learning. So let's talk about a very important concept that's called relearning. So when the when the phone was originally invented the phone was basically had just basically one role and that role was to make sure that you could communicate to the other to the person on the other end of the line so imagine if i wanted to talk to brian then i would pick up a phone i would dial a number that's that um you know indicates that's where i can reach brian and that's the only role that a phone played but then because of the advancement in technology a phone became more than that it became a calculator and it had basic games like snake and then look at where we are today in terms of what phones are today and this, the same gadget that was invented many, many years ago and had one function now carries a lot more functions. You don't need to carry around a map. You don't need to carry around an encyclopedia. You don't need to go to the stock exchange or buy a newspaper for you to find out you know, how stocks are trending. You don't need to, find, to buy a newspaper for you to see the news. You know, one app basically has everything in, in, in it. So think about it this way. If you were the consumer who's stuck at the point where you know you only knew a phone could make basically take uh, phone calls and that's all it could do. If you're stuck at that point and you refuse to move to the point that we are today, where phones are a lot more than that and can provide a lot more purpose in your life, where would you be? You'd of course be very obsolete, and that's why learning is very important. So learning is not just about you know I've learned today, I'm happy with everything I've learned, I've finished my degree, I'm done. So I don't need to learn anymore. You need to understand the importance of relearning. So the skills will change. There will be new skills that are coming up every time. And that's why it's important for, for us to keep learning. So how do you basically make sure that you become an active learner? And here are a few tips for you to become an active learner. So first thing is you could reflect in writing. So what happens is, you know, you use quick writes, as you mentioned, there's some people who are scrib scribble learners. We you know, you could also learn through solving things. You know, when you have a problem, you brainstorm solutions and you learn from that, basically trying to find out the different scenarios. Another way is that you could be an active learner by teaching. So for example, when I'm doing this session, I am also learning because some of the questions that uh, you pose at the end of the session or even feedback that you give also enables me to learn. You could learn by feeling things, you know, you could feel, you know, the intensity and the curiosity that comes for you, and it enables you to be able to stick for, for what you're learning to stick in your long-term memory. 
you could learn by developing questions, you know, generating questions for yourself. You could sketch out concepts, you know, draw out simple things that relate to the different things you're trying to learn. You know, you could compare notes with a peer, a friend, you know, a mentor, a coach, at the same time that also enables you to learn. So the point I'm trying to make here is there's many ways for you to become an active learner. And what's most important is to, once you do start to know yourself, what type of a learner you are, then create the right environment and create the right way for you to learn. I can tell you for free for myself, as I mentioned, I watch a lot of videos. What I do is every day I sit down and I think about, okay, so from that video that I've watched, what are the two or three main points that I want to take out of it? So I don't transcribe the whole video and basically have 10 pages, you know, of everything that was said in the video. But I just write down what are the key points. And every time I surprise myself, because every time I go back to the notebook where I wrote that, I always surprise myself because I learn and it kind of also, I relearn what I had learned before. Basically, when I go back to it and I read them, I'm like, oh, wow, I, you know, this is a good point that I need to remember for tomorrow when I'm doing my kind of thing. So just that that's an example of how to be an active learner. And more importantly, there's no better time than now to read. And I'll tell you why, because it is not just Google and Zoom that are free. A lot of learning courses are now free online, just thankfully because of the COVID-19 issue that we have. So Coursera has offered a lot of courses free. LinkedIn Learning has also offered a lot of courses free. But at the same time, you know, there's also the University of YouTube, which is also free to everyone. And you can learn a lot from YouTube. So feel free to always engage yourself in learning. And there's a famous quote that basically says, you know, um, you should only end your day if you've learned something. So if you wake up in the morning and you learn one thing that day, then your day should be achieved. If you end your day and you've not learned anything new that whole day, then you've basically not achieved your goal for that day. So make sure you're learning every day because that's one of the most important skills that you enable you to perform well in, in uh, the future. And I just want to end that bit with this quote that basically says, that um, you know, the people who will be illiterate in the 21st century will be those who can will not be those who cannot read and write because we've already you know and uh, done a lot of work to get people to read and write better. But it will be those people who cannot learn and learn and relearn new skills. So importantly, you need to make sure that you can learn new skills and learn uh, similar to that example that I gave to the phone, and also relearn new things. So it's very important for you to keep learning as an important skill for yourself. So just checking the temperature, are we all together? Maybe we can just type a quick yes, you know, if we're if we together and then we can move on to the second point. Um, and at the same time, um, you know, if you have any question, you can start typing out the questions and we'll basically come to them when we get to the, to the final bit of this. So just a quick temperature check. How is everyone doing? Are we together? Okay, perfect. I'm seeing uh, some good responses that we are all together. Okay, so it's good to check that uh, you know haven't lost you. So I think the second point that I wanted to talk about is active experimenting. So I'm not sure if everyone can basically relate to this, but this was one of my favorite cartoons when I was growing up. Um, it's called Dexter's Laboratory, um, and it used to come on Cartoon Network. So what used to happen is Dexter used to do a lot of experiments, and his sister used to botch a lot of them, used to just come in, ruin a lot of them, and it used to create a lot of humor. But if you think about what was happening in that um, particular cartoon, that's what life is about. It's about experimenting, it's about failing, it's about embracing external things, because you will not always have control of everything. There will be good example is this coronavirus when we started out we had a big plan for this year everyone did and at the same time what is happening right now we we have an issue you know uh, that's affected the whole world literally stopped a lot of things you know if you had a plan to be to travel the world this year you have to basically postpone your plan to next year or even year after next who knows so it's very important for us to think about the importance of experimenting because that's what life is about but also, we learn a lot from each of these experiments and let's keep that learning going. So you could always ask yourself, you know, but if I decide to experiment, what happens if I fall? But remember on the flip side, you should also ask yourself, what happens if you fly? Because if you do, do, do an experiment and it does succeed, what will happen is the joy you get out of 
landing it um, and being successful is a lot more than the regret you will feel when you think about it and see somebody else do exactly what you could have done and get the success out of it. So it's important for us to always think about just experiment. And there's very simple and very little ways that you can try out different things and basically know whether it will be a success and all that. But for experimenting to be a success, you know, we must acknowledge that employers and workplaces must enable what is called psychological safety. So what is psychological safety? It's about, you know, allowing people to admit mistakes. It's about allowing people to learn from failure. So you try out something, it fails. You know, what you happen is you reflect back and think about why did it fail? You document those reasons. And at the same time, you think about what could I have done differently to basically learn have a better outcome than what we had now. You know, people share ideas, that's also part of psychological safety. And this all leads to better innovation and decision making. On the flip side of psychological safety is an environment of psychological danger. What happens there is that people are fearful of admitting mistakes, people blame each other, and they're less likely to share their views. And the big issue there is that you have a common knowledge effect whereby the impact of the business will only be affected and will only be led by what the leadership or what the managers actually know. So as businesses, as people in the different environments, we must enable psychological safety for people to be able to embrace the concept of active um, experimenting. And I just wanted to touch on some of the people who we see today and we think they're very big successes and just basically highlight some of their famous failures, but nobody ever talks about their failures, but they would have never been where they, where they are if they didn't embrace those failures. So think about somebody like Michael Jordan, one of the most famous basketballers of the world. And what happened is he's missed more than 9,000 shots. But I'm sure if, you, if I just put up the picture of Michael Jordan, it's not the thing that comes to mind in terms of just thinking about, oh God, my God, this guy is a failure. He missed 9,000 shots. What you remember is he was the MVP for, of basketball back in the days. Another person who, who we see and we think about as a huge success is Steve Jobs. You know, we look at Apple phones that are there today and we think, you know, this great man actually started this. But does anybody ever remember that he was fired from the very company that he started? Nobody does. You know, the last one that I wanted to highlight is J.K. Rowling. For those uh, Harry Potter fans who, who we may have or people who just heard about the Harry Potter uh, books and the Harry Potter movies, you know, who remembers that her manuscript was rejected 12 times before it was first accepted? And even when it was first accepted, she had so many loopholes to, for her to pass before the book was actually published. So it took her so long, but happened you know she kept trying she kept doing it and when her book was actually published she's actually one of the most successful authors that we have to date you know she's had movies she's had the books uh, go on to be bestsellers so the point i'm trying to make is to make is about failing more often so you must fail more often if you ever want to succeed embrace failure failure is just success in progress you know every time you fail just think about stop think and say you know what could i have done differently if it is something you can do now and do it differently now then go ahead and do it if you can't do it now then what you simply do is just basically say you know the next time i get this opportunity to 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 do this i will do it differently by achieving these two or three different things so embrace failure and remember experimenting is very very important so how do you basically do active experimenting? And it's a very simple model. Uh, try to put it out into a model, but there are only very few elements here. So first things first is that you must desire the outcome. If you think about, you know, if you want to start your own company, if you want to go ahead and, and have your, your, you know, your try out in a, in a big company and, and start off from the bottom as you work your way up the corporate ladder, you must desire that first of all. And then secondly, there's what is called the theory method. And it's just very simple. It's about active learning. So we've already spoken about active learning. Know yourself what type of a learner you are. And at the same time, embrace and be willing to learn something new every day. Then lastly, observe. So you could have a mentor, you could have a coach, you could have a manager, you could have a lecturer, you know, who's helping you and guiding you through the process. So make sure you observe what they're doing and take as much learnings out of it. 
And you don't have to identify a specific coach or a specific mentor. The good thing about this digital world is that you could have a mentor or a coach, you know, who you watch their YouTube videos. They have a vlog or a blog somewhere that you read what they're writing, what they're posting. And you could say that's the kind of person who's shaping you to what you want to become. So just identify who that is, observe what they're doing and try as much as possible and practice it. So the next part I, I've hinted to is about practicing. So remember, practice makes perfect. If you don't practice, you can never be good at something. So, and in this practice is also to remember about having a psychological safe space. So embrace failure and the people who are around you, get them to also embrace failure. Tell them, you know, you know, this thing could fail, but at the same time, it's worth a try because everything that comes and we see it as good in this world, actually one way or another might have come from somebody who gave it a shot and tried it out. Then the last thing is to learn. Again, learning comes a second time. So you need to learn from your results. So you've practiced it, learn ideally from the results that you've come up with, and then decide what you want to do next. And the most important thing is to repeat. So this is not something that you do once, you know, you try out, maybe you want to start your own business. You say, you know, today I will start my business. So maybe I want to look for a, for a, for a good job. You try one company, that company rejects you and you're like, oh my God, I'm so done. No, no, no. Give it a try tomorrow. Give it a try the day after tomorrow. I can tell you for free, I was rejected in Unilever the first time I applied, but nothing, nothing stopped me from applying the second time because I told myself, you know what, maybe the first time I tried, there are people who are better than me. But because that whole time, between the time when I applied the first time and I applied the second time, I kept learning. What happened is the second time I tried, I was actually better a better person, a better candidate, and that's why I got in the second time. So think about things like those, because that's an example of a failure that I have also embraced myself, but at the end of the day, ended up getting some good success story out of it. Okay, so just checking on time, I can see we still have uh, 20 more minutes. I want to leave some good time for Q&A for everyone. So um, I'll quickly get through the last piece and then we can basically have about 15 or so minutes for, for question and answer at the end. So again, a quick temperature check. Are we together? I'm just looking at the Q&A box as well. So we don't have any questions so far, but feel free to post questions um, because these are coming through and we can be able to, to answer them as we get to the final part. I'm seeing somebody here said she loved the um, Dexter as well. So good to hear that I'm not the only fan of Dexter's laboratory, that you have good childhood memories. Okay, so temperature check, we are together. Okay, uh, Juliet, you say you're present. Good to hear from you. Okay, so let's proceed to the last point and then we can basically have about 15 or so questions, um, 15 or so minutes for questions at the very end. So thankfully we are we're almost at the end and this this last speech is about active branding and the most important thing is just about branding yourself. So what happens is too many people overvalue what they are not and the same people undervalue what they are. So if I was to ask somebody what's your most important success, you know, you'd get a lot of people who overvalue their successes, but you'd also have people who undervalue some of the great things that they've done with their lives. But at the same time, what's most important is for you to understand your own value. It's not what I judge as, as the value, but for you to understand what is your true value. And value is more, is more than just character. Value is about defining what your purpose is. And I'm sure you've had this term purpose and you, you, know, you think about you know, what is my purpose in life. And um, you know, this, there's this quote by Robert uh, Bryan who says, the, purpose of life is a life of purpose, you know, but it's just a word play. So if you think about what is purpose, the biggest problem is that when people are looking for a life purpose is that they misunderstand what that means. They think about the, the common questions that people think about is, you know, purpose is what I should do with my life. Purpose is, you know, you just ask the question, what is my life purpose or what is a life of purpose? Or even you know, also some people think about what can I do with my time that is important. So none of this is about purpose. So purpose is really about asking the right question. You know, if you think about right now, what would make you forget to eat or even to go and poop? 
what is that one thing that when you're doing or when you're thinking about it, you you urge to eat or your urge to poop, you know, which are very, very intrinsic human things that we do. What is that thing that that you know makes you forget that? You know, for some people it could be how are you going to save the world? So if that's for you, then ask yourself that question. Or another way to think about it would be if you are to die one year from today, how would you want people to remember you? So those are some of the fundamental questions that you could ask yourself, you know, as you're trying to get your purpose. But I'd really like to, to urge you to watch a, a YouTube video. It's actually about uh, five or so minutes long um, it's by Adam Leipzig. And he has a very simple formula. And I'll use this to introduce myself. Um, so he just says, on the left-hand side, ask yourself these five questions. Who are you? What do you do? Who do you do it for? What do you, they want or need? And how do they change as a result? And this particular formula helped me to be able to understand myself, me to be able to, to what my purpose was in life. So, you know, for me, I think about myself, of course, who am I is very simple. So I'm Michael and I'm, I'm an analytical guy. I try as much as possible to help people simplify complex problems, you know, and find solutions. So why, who do, who do I do it for? I do it for business leaders. I do it for future leaders of the world. And I want them to be able to appreciate themselves. And what do they want or what do they need is that they want to grow in their careers. They want to be able to grow their businesses or grow their companies. And how they change as a result of that is that they take decisive action. Because you know, for every problem, there is a solution. It's just about identifying what that solution is and taking the right decision. So I help them to be able to, to define what is the right course of action and what is the right action that they should take today. And, no, and if, even if that course of action is wrong, you know, how do we tweak it tomorrow? How do we stop it you know, in case we need to stop it? But what action do we take tomorrow that basically corrects the action that was wrong? To? And this has really helped me to, to be able to, to grow in my life and in my career. And it's shaped all these parts of my life. So number one, it's shaped to what my career aspirations are. If you ask me, you know, what, what I want to do as my next role, it's based on my purpose. My past purpose is about helping business leaders to grow. So what I aspire in my next job is basically about being able to live true to my purpose. The tasks that I'm most proud of right now in, the, in my uh, short or long life, depends on how you look at it, they're all linked to my purpose. If you were to give me 10 tasks for me to do, how I prioritize them will simply also be linked to my purpose. And last myself, and I mean, and lastly, how I carry myself, you know, that's about branding. So how I brand myself, how I bring myself out. If I was to meet somebody and have an elevator pitch where I just introduce myself for 30 seconds, what I would want to squeeze into those 30 seconds is just letting them know, you know, if they have a solution, if they have a problem, I can help them get a solution. And imagine how powerful that is um, you know, if you just understand yourself and understand your own purpose. So I want to conclude with this particular quote, uh, which, is, which comes from The Art of War, uh, which is a book um, I have never read. Like I said, I don't read books, but I've watched many videos about, about the book. So it basically says, mastering others is strength, but at the same time, mastering yourself is true power. So if you think about it, most of the time we think about, you know, for us to win a war, for us to be the best, you know, we just need to be better than my competitors. But the most important thing is for you to master yourself, because if you master yourself, you'll be more powerful than if you just master your enemy and master the people around you. And last but not least, don't forget to think outside the box. So you've probably heard this many times, and it does sound very cliche but it's still very important for you to think outside the box. So for everything, remember to keep learning, remember to keep experimenting and remember to brand yourself correctly and you'll be ready for the future. So thank you very much. I can see some questions coming in. I don't know how Alfie and Brian, you want to handle those questions. Should I just go at them? Yeah, so Mike, um, first of all, thank you so much. Wow, that was an amazing, amazing bit you've just done. In terms of questions, yeah, you could just go at the ones you can see. And if uh, I notice anything that you might have missed, I'll just prompt you to go back. Okay. So I think the 
question I'll tackle is from uh, Kelly G. So who's asking, what are some of the tips you could highlight from the Unilever application experience, both the first um, and second time um, that I applied? So I think the two things that I would say um, that I would highlight is number one, the importance of being yourself. So in the Unilever application process, you get asked the same question many times, and it's just basically trying to give you the opportunity for you to be yourself. And two important things is that number one, don't sell yourself short. And number two, don't oversell yourself. So make sure you play it somewhere in between. Have a person who you can practice with, have a person who you can, you can, you know, even a simple question like, tell me about yourself. Just have a 30 second, one minute answer that you can try out with your colleague, with a friend, and see some of the feedback they could tell you. You know, if I hear that kind of an answer, is it good? Is it bad? And at the same time, also, as I mentioned, use videos on the, on the internet that you can also watch that enable you to be able to, to learn a lot more about how to answer such questions, uh, like tell me about yourself. So for me, those are some of the tips I would say. So keep learning, to summarize it, it's keep learning. To summarize it, it's think uh, outside the box and practice with the people that, that you are with. So the next question um, that I will answer is from Danson Muga, who says um, they appreciate this um, and they're saying they're feeling inspired. Uh, so we have a question here from Dr. Jane Wamboy Duo, who's saying the greatest challenge during this pandemic is the adoption of technology by the older age, 45 years and above, because they have been used to do things in a certain way. Any key message on how to bring them on board? So I would say the main the key thing that I would say about how to bring them on board is it's a journey. So we also struggle with that, not only with the with the older age, but even with the younger age. Because if you think about adoption of technology, I can give you a very um, simple example. So we recently moved our reports um, in Unilever from just you know being very basic Excel reports to using an online platform that's called Power BI, which is a lot more powerful in terms of reporting and um, and you know creating better charts and visuals and all that so we, even at a younger age we had to teach them and we had to show them how to how to be able to to be comfortable around the new platform and to be able to get the answers to the questions that they have so i would say in terms of bringing people on board to adopt technology is number one understand their challenge so understand what makes them afraid understand what makes them not embrace it as easily and with that, the second bit would then to be able to find out what you can get them to do differently. Then secondly would be work with them in a journey because you know, if it's your role, say for example, to help somebody to adopt um, that technology or to be able to feel comfortable, you know, work with them the journey, show them that you know, it's, as, it's not as complex as they think, help them to simplify the problems and help them you know, day by day to learn something new such that they can be able to embrace it and and start learning so it's not about putting a lot of information in one point it's about going with them on a journey and getting them to be able to feel comfortable and to adopt the technology so a good question here from uh, javan who says why don't i read books <laughs> so i would say myself i don't read books um and that's basically comes from the type of learner that I discovered that I am. So the good thing is, if you think about the world now versus five to 10 years ago, there was very little in terms of learning uh, options that there was. You'd had to work with books because that was the only way you could learn. But thankfully today, a lot of those books have been converted to different things. They've been converted to audiobooks. They've been converted to videos. They've been converted you know, to a lot more ways in which you can consume the book. So for me, I, I embraced the new ways of learning because I learned, you know, I can't sit down to read a book for, for an hour or so, just from my own concentration and, um, and uh, just understanding of how I learn. So, but when I'm watching a video, me being a visual learner, when I'm watching a video, I do get a lot more and I'll remember a lot more from the video. So I'm just embracing who I am and embracing, um, you know, my challenge to be able to think differently. So some more questions here that I can see. 
uh, just sifting through here. So Effie Yegala, you're asking, other than Adam Leipzig's formula, how do you answer the question, tell me more about yourself? That's a very good question. And if you think about tell me more about yourself, it depends on who you're, talking, who you're answering it to and what you're telling them. And I can tell you for free, in every interview that I go for, I don't answer that question the same way because it depends on who's in the panel and it depends on, on um, what they expect to hear from me. So a good example is in the, in the initial sessions, you know, when you're meeting with, with the hiring manager and possibly one or two members of HR, those people would be interested to know, you know, what is your career background? Um, what, what is your learning background? So that's where you concentrate more. But as you progress in the interview process and you think about maybe there's a point where you're meeting a senior manager or you're meeting a CEO of the company that you're about to work for, you know, they could have the same level of interest for your, for your career, um, you know, your career journey and at the same time of your learning journey, but they could be more interested in you as a person. And most importantly is to tailor that response based on your audience. Answer it based on what you think would be the best thing you, you can leave them with. And at the same time, think about what you want them to remember about you. Do you want them to remember you just by the fact that you've done a degree or you've done a master's or a PhD? Or do you want them to remember you by something a bit more powerful? So for me, when I answer such a question is, I do put a bit of emphasis on, on of course, my career, spirit, my career uh, journey so far. But the other bit that I also make sure that I bring inside is the kind of person that I am, you know, just basically saying that what is my purpose and at the same time, leaving them with a message of if I had to take a choice between something that is important for me purpose wise and something that's just a task, anything that fits in with my purpose 100% has better priority. But of course, I'm still willing to be able to flex for the sake of um, priorities that might be misaligned between myself and what the company or the business wants. So I hope I've answered that question. I have another question uh, from Grayson Duta who's asking, um, how can one overcome procrastination completely? That's a good one. And I think procrastination is one of the th biggest thieves of time. And the main reason for that is whenever you think about saying you put off something for tomorrow, then you pay something called time interest. I watched a very interesting talk um, by somebody who was talking about the concept of time interest. So if you have something occupy your mind now, so let's say maybe during this particular session, I get a brilliant idea that basically, you know, say for example, for a task I've been trying to, to finish and I have an idea about it, then you need to take action about it immediately. And that action could be one of two things. So it could be number one, that the action you take is about you know scheduling it for you to work on it later or the action could be for you to to work on it right now if it does take a short while and maybe you have the time to do it but at the same time make sure you take action so i think what's most important and how to overcome procrastination what i learned from that talk is the importance of taking action so if you think about something now and you take action and say i will plan this for tomorrow afternoon and you do maybe write it down somewhere or schedule it somewhere that you'll, that you'll uh, take care of it tomorrow. Make sure you prioritize it. And that's a very simple way to, to overcome procrastination because when you do get to tomorrow and you decide to procrastinate it more, then at the end of the day, you're, you're basically getting to that space of procrastination. So it's take action and start the journey slowly by slowly and you'll be able to overcome procrastination, I would say. So, Another question we have is um, in our workplaces, sometimes we get so busy to the extent of forgetting to take lunch or even tea breaks to finish the tasks at, at hand. Would we still consider that as part of our purpose? I think the simple answer to that would be no. So I would say differentiate the task and differentiate your purpose because a task could be that you're told to jump and uh, you ask how high should I jump? But your purpose could be in the same jumping, it could be, you know, maybe you want to achieve the highest jump uh, of all the people in your office. So if it still links to your purpose, then it should be the right thing. But if it's just a task you're doing, then differentiate those two things is what I would say. 
So we have a good question here from Evans, who's asking which one is better, Power BI or Tableau? I think that's a very um, interesting question. So I think for me, it's just simple. Um, yeah, actually, like I just like Power BI better, but it's a bit of a technical question. So another, Naomi is saying, wow, this has been short lived. Um, I wish you go on and on, but very informative. Thank you, you're welcome. Faith says, due to the pandemic, it has made all of us to accept the inevitable change. We've all been forced to embrace the change and think differently. Glad to hear that. Um, DJ Medan is saying, which other way is appropriate for you to learn second after videos? So if the question is about how I learn, so for me it would be videos and audios. But um, depending on who you are, so you could decide to do videos, you could decide to do audio books, you could decide to do uh, books as well, or you could even decide to be able to read blogs or, um, or some things like those. So I think it just depends on what you want to learn and what type of a learner you are. And based on that, you'll be able to know which is the best way for you to learn. So Grace has a question here. What could be better daily routine for an entrepreneur? For example, access a successful day for business-oriented leader. So if I get that question correctly, you're basically asking, um, you know, is it better to have a daily routine? I would say yes, but at the same, at the same time, I would say no. So with a daily routine, what would happen is you, you'd easily have um repetition and it would become very monotonous but i would say leave space for the important things you know if learning is important you can schedule it into your calendar and your plan for the day you could say you know i wake up at six i um take an hour to learn um or i take my coffee and then take an hour to jog and then learn later so but at the end of the day what's important schedule it What's not important, leave space. Because at the end of the day, there'll be a lot of things that will come in. So you need to leave space for today, a friend could call you, um, you know, for an interesting meeting or an interesting thing. So leave space for such things in as much as you have a daily routine. So another question here, can you please list um, other alternatives of online learning websites other than Coursera? So I think we have LinkedIn Learning. Uh, that's another one that you could embrace. And we also have, um, I'm a very huge fan of the University of YouTube. I think YouTube did come to, to revolutionize learning. And you might think, you know, it's about vlogs and it's about uh, the Jesus of this world, but there's a lot of content on YouTube that you can actually get that could help you learn and to be able to get a lot more. So there is YouTube, there is um, teaching learning, there is Coursera, there is, I saw some website as well from UNESCO. So there's plenty of sources. Uh, feel free to Google and you'll get a lot more. So Yvonne, you're asking, when you feel like nothing is working out, what would you do? I think that's a very good question because a lot of times we, we have a situation whereby we struggle with things just not working out. And I think the important thing is the reflection part. If you remember when we spoke about how to be an active learner, reflection was a big there. So sometimes you take a step back and say, you know, let me think about why things are not working out. You know, why do I think, say for example, you've been going for many interviews and you've not been accepted. So is it because you're answering things, maybe you're not saying what they want to hear. Maybe it's how, it's the kind of jobs you're applying for. So it's important for you to keep trying uh, to reflect and think about different things and it will enable you to be able to grow. So take a step back, relax, um, ask yourself questions about what you could do differently, keep experimenting. And one day when you do get something that works, then keep improving on what has worked. And trust me, you will have a formula for success. Okay. A good question here from uh, Steven Ondieki. What is the best way a project coordinator can rebrand himself? Uh, just trying to think about what kind of a space that question comes from. But I think if you're just asking about how you present yourself as the best place person for the task ahead, it's like I said, it's about learning. I can tell you for free, no one is appointed to a role or no one is given a job because they were 100% the best candidate uh, and they know everything. It's because you are possibly a fit for the culture of the company and you are possibly 
a fit of somebody who could be molded and who could be taught a few things. So just brand yourself as that kind of a person who can be molded, who's willing to learn, who's willing to embrace experimenting, and you'll be able to, to succeed. So the last question we have, um, just looking at the perspective of time and the fact that we are almost running out of time. So I'm seeing Juliet here saying, thanks for the presentation. Under active learning, please share a list of the actual sites. I think we've spoken about them. Um, some of them are Coursera, some of them are uh, LinkedIn learning. And the good thing is they are actually free right now. Uh, we've spoken about that one for project coordinator. Uh, yep, how can I deal with stress or rather attitude so as to have that mindset for learning? I think that's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant question. You know, how do you deal with stress? So stress can be a motivator, but at the same time, it can be a demotivator. There are certain people who, whenever you're stressed, you get a lot more out of yourself. And there are certain people who, whenever you're stressed, you actually struggle with things. So I think importantly is to embrace the stress and know what kind of a stress it is. So for me, I can tell you something. Every time when I know a deadline is approaching for a task, I get stressed and I don't like that stress. For me, it ends up being a negative stress. So what happens is I choose to avoid the stress by planning out way ahead. So if I know something is required for a presentation on Friday, I start planning for it now. And basically how I plan for it is I schedule small bits of time for me to work on the different tasks. And in scheduling that time, if there's people I need to collaborate with, if there's people I need to get input from, I make sure that I've built in the delays or the time that it would take for people to, to give me that uh, data or that thing. And if it's a task that I need to complete myself, maybe I just need to learn or I just need to, to um, embrace and, and work on something, then I build that time in as well. So I think the message I'm trying to pass on is, just know yourself, know what, how you respond to stress. If stress is a motivator for you, embrace it and let it propel you. But if at the same time, stress is a demotivator, basically it doesn't help you to perform, then take advantage and plan ahead so that you don't uh, have the stress. So I think um, just looking at the time, we are out of time and we might actually just get cut off. So I just wanted to say thank you very much. You have been an amazing, amazing audience. Thank you very much for all the questions. I've tried as much as possible to answer most of them, if not all of them. And uh, feel free for, for you to keep learning and uh, to get a lot more from it. So over to you, Brian and Alfie. Hi, Mike. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Mike, for the session. I, this has been an amazing one. Uh, we have recorded the session, so in case you still want to get back to what uh, Mike said, I'll be sharing the link to this session, say tomorrow or as soon as it's ready on our social media spaces, which I've put down there on the on the chat box. So be sure to look out for that. Um, just to touch on a few things that I'm seeing in the chat space, Mike, if anyone would like to reach you for follow up or any more questions or advice, how do they do that? You're on mute. You're on mute. Oh, sorry, Brian. Yes, I was on mute. I was saying, um, I think basically through you, um, you can basically channel, you know, people who have questions, uh, you know, would like to reach out to me directly, and I would be happy to to help where I can. Awesome, awesome. So, uh, Yvonne Kwambi, I hope you're still on the line and you're hearing that. Um, you can reach out to us on social media, and then I'll just channel whatever. Uh, sort of info you'd like uh, Mike to help you with to 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 him directly. Um, yeah, and um, basically from me is a big big thank you to everyone who has joined this call. It's been amazing seeing all the participation and all the attention that guys have been paying, and all the brilliant things that guys are doing even with their lives and thinking about, especially during this time. I just want to welcome uh, Johnson to say a few words as we wind up. Uh, Brian, hey, you can hear me? Can hear you loud and clear. Yes, yes. I want to say most sincerely and big thank you for actually bringing this good age to the University of Nairobi with a lot of passion. Eh? 
And uh, I must say, I've enjoyed Mike's uh, presentation on purpose and uh, authenticity, because that's where we are missing uh, all of us, that we try to copy other people's and not being yourself and not discovering yourself. And, uh, and somebody who said there are two very important days in one's life, the day you are born and the day you discover uh, why you are born. <laughs> so I think this presentation, uh, I also want to reason it from beginning to the end so that uh, I can internalize it myself and for my, the sake of the students. So mine is to say thank you to Unilever Academy and I say every week, if we can have this every Friday, two to four, two to three, I think it will be fantastic. And I also want to thank you, my, my students, who are 80 of them. Eh? That's a whole class. My students, thank you very much for responding to our call for webinars. And uh, I think you have learned something great. And we look forward for more of such. Alfie for hosting us and everybody. So, Mike. Can you come to the university after post COVID? Yes, I would love to to have a yes, one session. on one. Yes, I would be very happy to host you and to give you a class. <laughs> thank you, thank you, awesome. much appreciated. And no yeah, wonder you're you. a growth manager. Thank you very much. Yeah, and thanks, Johnson, and especially to the University of Nairobi for just the opportunity to interact with students and even for giving us a platform where we are able to express ourselves in the best way, way we know how. So thanks, Johnson. Thanks, Naomi. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Naomi, for always being there, for always being available. Hi, Naomi. Hi, how are yes. you? I'm really, really good. How is everyone? Everyone uh, seems to be doing well. We've had quite a bit of participation. <laughs> so thanks so much. Yeah? And thanks, right. Alfie, of course, for always making this possible. So yes. yeah, guys. Next Friday, we might be coming back with another session on communication. So also watch out for that. And we hope mm -hmm. to see you all there again. So cheers, guys. Sawa, so, thank you yeah. so much, everyone. OK, bye-bye. We could all write bye. our bye Thank you, Mike. <laughs> OK, bye-bye, guys. Brian. Yes. Do you want a recap? <laughs> yeah, have we gone to private yet? Not no. yet. Okay. Maybe I'll speak and help what she has left. Alvi. You can exit everyone else. Alvi. Yes, um, let me see here. Can you exit the participant? Uh, you only lead the, the panelist. Um, yes, I can do that. Please do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good people. Hi. Hi, Alfie. Are we on? Yeah. Are we? Are we? Yes, are we, we are good? Yes. Um, we yes. are good to go. Okay. Hi, Brian. Yes, awesome. I'm good. How are you? So, uh, just Mike just dropped off a bit. I think he has another meeting or a call. 
As soon as he's available, he's available, he can rejoin if he's there. So so I, I we can try to recap where we, oh. what we have done. Okay, so, so um, I think, Alfie, I don't know if we can stop 